So I will not be talking specifically about modern Israeli Hebrew today, uh, but I will be talking about many other Jewish languages. So I wanted to start off quickly by asking us as a group, how many Jewish languages do we know? So can anybody think of any Jewish languages not modern Israeli Hebrew? Yiddish is the only one. Okay. Yiddish? Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that's why. Ladino. Ladino? Do yeah. people speak Ladino? Do you know? Yeah. Do we know any others? Yeah. Well, there's ancient Hebrew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So on here we've got so far Yiddish, uh, Ladino, Ancient Hebrew. Ancient Hebrew. Yeah. Any so others? Is liturgical Hebrew separate from ancient or modern Hebrew? Yeah. Rabbinic Hebrew or Mishnaic Hebrew. Mishnaic Hebrew. Yeah, that's one of them. We also have Ge'ez, which is the language of the Better Israel. It's, well, it's their liturgical language. So it's a Jewish liturgical language, Ge'ez. We also have Arabic, which is also a Jewish language. We have Telugu. There is a Jewish dialect of Telugu. Pasi, which is a Persian a Persian derived language spoken in, spoken in Azerbaijan by a, by the world's only 100% Jewish town. And we also have Israeli sign language, which is a dialect of German sign language, and many, many others. Aramaic, there's liturgical Aramaic, Neo Aramaic. Can anybody think of one more? Paketia? Paketia, right then, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there are many more Jewish languages other than the ones that we've just mentioned. And I will be focusing on a uh, few of these, but obviously not all of them because we do not have time for that. Um, so yeah, uh, to start with, Hebrew. Uh, somebody mentioned ancient Hebrew. So Hebrew is one of the Jewish languages. And the earliest Hebrew writing was discovered at Hirbet Teyafa, which uh, dates from the 10th century BCE. Uh, Israelite tribes established the kingdom in uh, Canaan or Canaan at the beginning of the first millennium. And that uh, later split with the kingdom of Israel in the north and Judah in the south. So the kingdom of Israel was destroyed by Assyrians in the year 722 BCE. Uh, does anybody want to tell me what this, what this is depicting? Can anybody take a guess or knows what this is? R Rashi script? Nope. Dead Sea Scrolls? I don't know. No, nope. it looks like some kind of hieroglyphics. No, nope. one more guess. Well, the alphabet down the left. Right, this is Hebrew. Woo. This is uh, the earliest Hebrew script, otherwise known as Paleo Hebrew. So just take a look. You probably nobody recognizes any letters on there, but that is. The language that the Torah was written in, Paleo Hebrew. Uh, so it's the earliest uh, script used to write the Torah and pre biblical inscriptions. It was known in the Talmud as the Livona script, which may be identified with Lebanon, and that's in the Sanhedrin 21b 22, uh, which is part of the Talmud. And during the sixth century, uh, the Babylonian exile of Judeans which are the Jews, uh, to the, uh, during that time, they, uh, they took on the Imperial Aramaic script, which gradually replaced Hebrew. So this at the top is the Imperial Aramaic script. So probably people recognize more letters on this, right? So that is the 
uh, script from which what we now call Hebrew is derived. It's derived from the Imperi Imperial Aramaic script, not from the Hebrew script. Um, so Samaritan Israelites continue to use the Paleo-Hebrew alphabet to this day. And that's it there on the uh, bottom right of the screen. So as you can see, it's basically the Paleo-Hebrew uh, Paleo alphabet. Who are Samaritan Israelites, Martin? So Samaritans are another Israelite religion uh, that has a population of 900. And they, were, they are descended from Israelites that did not that were not exiled. And they live to this day in Nablus, one village in Nablus in the West Bank, and another one near in Holon, near Tel Aviv. And they have a religion very, very similar to Judaism, but also vastly different. And the Samaritans. So you're familiar with the term Good Samaritan, I'm sure. Um, that's a reference to that, that community. Would, so, they, would they identify as being Jewish? They are not Jewish, they are Israelis. They're, they're Israelis. They're Israelites. Israelites. Yeah, so the Israelites, as I mentioned, there was the Kingdom of Israel and the Kingdom of Judah. The Kingdom of Israel was in the north and the Kingdom of Judah was in the south. The Judeans were exiled by the, by the Assyrians, where they, that's the Jews, where they took on the Imperial Aramaic script and brought back with them Judaism. And before that, there was the Israelite religion, which had two branches, which one which developed into Judaism and one which developed into Samaritanism. Hmm. Okay, so Aramaic became the common language of Israel, Galilee and Samaria during that time. Uh, in Judah, um, Hebrew survived with a uh, heavy Aramaic influence. So Judah was the southern kingdom. And uh, in that kingdom, Hebrew remained the main spoken language, but of course with a heavy Aramaic influence. Uh, with the destruction of the second temple, Hebrew became a literary language only, then followed by a Gentile language, which was used for extra community functions and a Jewish in-group vernacular. The vernacular is, is the language we use every day. Uh, so in, we're now using in, English vernacular. Um, and uh, Jewish languages tend to have a literary language, a Gentile language, which is used outside of the community, and a Jewish in-group uh, language. So one of those, one of the languages which has, uh, or a dialect of Hebrew which has survived to this day is Ashkenazic Hebrew, which is not necessarily the Hebrew that we use liturgically. Uh, and it was a written language. It, it remained a, a written language ever since the 12th century, uh, where it developed in Central Europe. And it spread to Eastern Europe as the high register of Yiddish speakers. So when I say high register, is it does anybody not understand what I mean by that? The high register? So I put pork and beef. So if somebody said, oh, what are you having for dinner? I'm going to have a slice of, beef, a slice of cow and my mum's going to eat some pig. That would be the low register. The English uses a high register that comes from Norman French. So it's a class difference. So the high register of Yiddish speakers was always Ashkenazic Hebrew, uh, and the low register was a variety of German, which developed into Yiddish. So like, uh, like Norman French, like Norman English. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, Ashkenazic Hebrew is su um, surprisingly still used uh, productively among Hasidim. Uh, I've written among Hasidism, but I mean Hasidim. Um, it's also a vehicle of contemporary communication, so there are examples of COVID-19 notices, especially in Brooklyn, uh, Zoom schooling that happened in Ashkenazic Hebrew, um, and there are some linguists there that have uh, recently published papers on that. And the phonology, so the sound system of Ashkenazic Hebrew, uh, informs the Yiddish pronunciation of Hebrew words. So if you say anything like Shabbos, Akoidish Baruch or Yoichanan, 
or anything like that, or yeah, those kind of words, or uh, um, Simcha's Torah, or Simcha's Torah, that's uh, Ashkenazic Hebrew pronunciation. So are you familiar with uh, the uh, Tav and how it becomes an S sound, like bass, or Shabbos? Is but it, I thought people, that was Yiddish. That's not Yiddish, that's Ashkenazic Hebrew. But then those words are passed into Yiddish because that's the high register of Yiddish. Mm. Yeah. So just to make that clear, so like we say in English, beef, not we eat beef, we don't eat cow. And beef is the Norman, the Norman French or Anglo-Norman pronunciation. Um, of the same word that in French is pronounced bit. So we we use that kind of, to sound like higher class than we are maybe, or that kind of thing, we will use um, Anglo-Norman derived terms. And in Yiddish, they use Ashkenazic Hebrew terms and the pronunciation of which um, passes into Yiddish, like in words like Shabbos, etc. Yoich and then Toira. So, uh, we also have Jewish English, which might surprise a few people because they think, oh, well, isn't that just a, a slang or a, a, a lexicon or just like a, that's just English with a dif uh, different words. And so on the left, we have some of these words that are, of course, Yiddish words that are some of which are actually Ashkenazic Hebrew words that have passed into Jewish English. So if anybody says, um, oh, don't be so nebbish, that's like a pitiful person. That's somebody, if you say, don't be so ne uh, nebbish or don't be a schmuck, you're using Jewish English. And there's some examples there on the right. I'm spelling over this event, just a mensch, uh, get a snack to nosh on, etc. Or I'm schmoozing. This is Jewish English. So Jewish English is Yiddish influenced English, but also modern Israeli Hebrew lexicon. So I've heard people saying, no, but he's he's a really good guy, but mamash good guy. Like he's a mamash, he's like a really like without doubt a really good guy. Mamash, that's not Yiddish, that's modern Israeli Hebrew that's being used in Jewish English. Um, it's often used in yeshivas, where it's called yeshivish, but yes, yeshivish is a dialect of Jewish English. Not all, um, not all speakers of Jewish English will be speaking yeshivish. And features of Jewish English include, and this is universal for Jewish English, uh, pronouncing orange like orange, orange. I don't know if anybody's, if you say to yourself, give it a go, everybody, just say out loud whether mute or not, orange. See how you oh. sound, sound naturally. Do you say orange or do you say orange? So if you say orange, that's probably because you've been influenced by Jewish English. I myself, actually pronounce this vowel this way. Um, I don't have the face, but I do have the intonation, the height, and many of the health problems. So, <laughs> um, so another feature of Jewish English is a high engagement conversational style. So things like that include speaking at a faster rate, uh, often sounding a little bit melodic or a little bit overexcited to other people. And also cooperative overlapping. Can anybody tell me what cooperative overlapping means? Constant interruption. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Which is normal in, uh, in Jewish English. Um, there's also a cancellation that... style, sorry? So I was going to say, cooperative overlapping could be an, uh, an Olympic sport. Yes, exactly. 
yeah so i i've been at uh dinner tables where there's a mix of jews and non-jews and and people will be a little bit overwhelmed by the fact that so i have a friend who lives that just like 200 yards away from me and he converted to judaism and one day there was a bunch of north london jews and his sister who's non-jewish and she was overwhelmed by the cooperative overlapping and also happening at different angles diagonal over the table and all, all over the place and somehow everybody seems to know what's going on but she was there like a rabbit in the headlights so these kinds of norms in in speech communities tend to be accepted within the community but when you're mixing with others that's when they're they might be called interrupting instead of overlapping <laughs> <laughs> um so cantillation style at certain points in speech of Jewish English, this is a, a feature of Jewish of Jewish English. So you might you might do people might do things like if I was to ever give the speech today, maybe I'd be okay if everyone was quiet. That's a cantillation style, and it's sometimes mimics the way we lame. So the way we chant the Torah. Um, there's also a raised intonation in the third quarter of a speech utterance. Of a speech utterance is basically a sentence. So sometimes uh, that means in the last last but one quarter of what you're saying, you raise you raise the pitch or you raise the tone, and that makes it sound a little bit melodic. And also final D's, so words that end in D, will sound like T's. Mm -hmm. So good instead of good. Um, does anybody want to have a go at reading this in what they think may be Jewish English? Somebody be brave and read this sentence out loud. I'll try. Go ahead. Whenever you're shaykh connected, then you can be aid, witness. I have no idea if I'm saying it right or wrong, right? You're not going to interrupt and tell me? No, no. <laughs> okay. Whenever you're not, you're not. So why does Rashi say, that's because dina de mahuza dina, the law of the land is the law. It's because there, even if not dina de mahuza dina, Rashi says later, cause al din hu nitzavu b'nei noyach, all the children of Noah are commanded to follow this. The game, the non-Jews are sheikh to dinim laws. They're not sheikh to gitin, divorce laws. That's why it's good. Thank you. So let's, what was that? So, yeah, so let's hear uh, somebody saying this. Whenever you're sheikh, then you can be an aid. Whenever you're not, you're not. So why does Rashi say? That's because Dina de Machus Dina. It's because they're even if not Dina de Machus Dina, Rashi says later, because Al Din Huni, Stavu B'nei Nayach, the Gayam are Shaykh to Dinim, they're not Shaykh to Gitin, that's why it's good. So that's an example of probably a, a Yeshivish style Jewish English. So there's the feature there of the cantillation at the beginning. Whenever you're Shaykh, then you can be an aid, and then stop it. And then the, if you could hear that, it was rapid as well. And there's this Ashkenaz, Ashkenazic Hebrew influence. And there's also Aramaic there. Dina de Malchus Adina, pronounced as if it was Ashkenazic Hebrew. And then Gayim instead of Goyim, uh, Dinim. So Dinim, it should be in, in Hebrew, Dinim. But in, uh, in Ashkenazic Hebrew, it's Dinim. And Gitin, and then there's the Gut at the end. So, so Martin, I'm I'm a little yeah. confused. Are you saying that people speak the way that we just heard the recording? Yeah. When they're was... speaking English or when they're speaking what? Jewish, when they're speaking Jewish English. When they're speaking Jewish English. Yeah. I guess I don't know anybody who speaks Jewish English. <laughs> well, you do, you do, but you don't realize you do. <laughs> so, it's there's code switching. <laughs> There's code switching where people switch from one register to another one. So we we all do that. Um, so there will be features of Jewish English 
um, in all Jewish, there are features of Jewish uh, languages in all Jewish communities. So if you're a, from a family that's Jewish and you know that speaks English, there will be Jewish English features in your family. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and actually, you just you did uh, cooperative overlapping. <laughs> so you don't know that you yourself speak to English. <laughs> okay. okay. Right. I'm a little I'm a little confused, Martin. Yeah. When when that girl was that's the studying style of talking. Yeah. And the quickness of it was yeah. contrary to the study style of my family. Because okay. when they're studying they do it very slowly, accenting things very carefully, making sure people are listening. When you talk quickly like that, you know, like nobody's really paying attention. So she that's was, a little bit troubling. That feels more modern to me than traditional. She was just having a conversation with somebody. Mm -hmm. So she was just talking to somebody. She wasn't exactly studying. Um, but it's an example of uh, yeshivish style uh, Jewish English. But yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, it's just a, just one example, really, of uh, Jewish English. Um, do you have any Spanish speakers? If you do, let me know. I I used to live in Spain, as it happened. So so I still have some Spanish. Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, so, do you know the title of this newspaper from 1989? La, La Luz de Israel. In, in, in Castilian Spanish, it's La Luz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you translate it? The light. And the next sentence ab above the photo that says, Por Nisim Bueno. Uh, mañana, viernes, horas 9.05, con commemoration del grande okay so tomorrow friday at 905 there'll be a commemoration of uh kamal adatur who's turning 51 years old great well done so judeo spanish uh this is an, a newspaper from uh turkey from 1989 uh la luz de israel um judeo spanish is somewhat mutually intelligible with Castilian Spanish, but not completely. And for many reasons, there are many differences from Spanish. So what you just read, totally 100% you could understand, uh, but there would be many sentences in that newspaper that you would not be able to understand. <clears throat> um, so Judeo-Spanish is actually more than one variety. So there are two major groups of Judeo-Spanish. One is Hakitiya, which is spoken in North Africa and came from migrations in uh, the 15th to 16th centuries from the expulsion of Jews from Spain. Um, so you can see on the bottom left, they went to what's now Morocco, Algeria and Tunisia. Um, and then also other groups went to Palermo, which is where my mother is from. And then other communities went to Egypt and Palestine, Lebanon, uh, modern day Israel. Uh, another, co another community uh, developed into what's now called Judesmo or what we commonly refer to as Ladino. Uh, speakers of Ladino just call it Espanol. Uh, if not, they might say Gidio, which means Jewish, which is exactly the same word, it, it, with exactly the same meaning as Yiddish. Yiddish just means Jewish. Um, so, so yeah, uh, Judesmo or, or uh, Ladino is spoken in Crete, Athens in Greece, uh, ex-Yugoslavia, parts of Albania, Kosovo, uh, and Istanbul, notably as a big community in Istanbul to this day, and in Izmir as well, and in Thessalonica, which was called Selanik for a long time. Um, so also Belgrade, and then communities of Judesmo also moved up to Vienna, and even into uh, southern Poland and Hungary. Uh, and there are also Ladino speakers from Romania and Bulgaria. Um, and then, so that's two migrations of 
Spanish Jews. And then the other migration of Spanish and Portuguese Jews came to London, Amsterdam and Hamburg. And also, yeah, um, in later in the 17th century, the, the early seven, uh, late 17th century, early 18th century. And in the UK, we do not have a variety of Spanish or Portuguese, but we do have liturgical Portuguese used in the Spanish and Portuguese Orthodox community. We have some um, prayers in Portuguese. Ladino, I'm going to focus on Ladino for a bit. Uh, this developed in the Eastern Sephardic diaspora, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, it is not, as people tend to think of it, as 15th century Spanish. It is not 15th century Spanish, but it does have features, especially the ph phonology, so that's the sound system, and grammatical features of 15th century Spanish. Uh, Ladino means Latin, and it was the low register that people used in Al-Andalus uh, prior to the Reconquista, so when the Spanish uh, Catholics from the north, they weren't called Spanish, they were called Castilians, when they um, conquered what's now known as Spain. Uh, at that time, the average population, um, let's say the working class community, spoke Ladino, Latin, a Latin dialect, uh, which was basically 15th century Spanish. And the higher class, the upper classes spoke Arabic, and Hebrew, if they were Jewish, they spoke Hebrew. Uh, Ladino has Hebrew, Turkish, Greek, Arabic, and Italian lexicon, reflecting its various uh, contact languages. So uh, this is an example, uh, of, this is a recording of uh, Ladino spoken in Istanbul. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it was recorded originally in 1979, and I think it's been re-digitalized. Um, and can anybody, don't translate the whole thing, but can you have a quick look and see like, what do you think it's about, what's going on? What do you think it's about? I mean, there's a big clue on the right of the screen. <laughs> 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 so, so it's, so it's the wedding of Moshan. Moshan is a nickname for Moshe. Um, and it says in Istanbul there was a Moshan. Um, many, many, many um, uh, neighbors. Neighbors. Yeah brought him girlfriends, well, sorry, brides. They brought him brides, but he didn't want them. Um, he went out with a friend who said, Moshan, I'm going to bring you a, a bride, the most beautiful in Istanbul. And really, he, he, brought, he brought him to her. She was, uh, Luzior means like brilliant, literally the meaning of brilliant, like shining. Uh, she had a beautiful face. Uh, and his friend said, come on, Moshan, uh, take, the, take the bride, take her by the hand. Engage means by hand. Uh, so Moshan took her by the hand and uh, Moshan, take her to the cinema. So he took her to the cinema with a friend. Because why with a friend? Because you always had to have a, somebody accompanying you. You couldn't date by yourself. Um, so Moshan on, um, on uh, Monday... Uh, Monday is going to be the Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday. No, sorry, but Tuesday. Yeah, Moshan. Uh, for Tuesday, Tuesday is going to be the day of Tivila. Tivila means mikveh. Mikveh is uh, Hebrew, and actually, it's the Ashkenazic pronunciation. But Sephardim say Tivila, Tivila, Tivila. Um, we're going to wait at the door together, you and I. Either Moshan, come on, Moshan. Uh, it's it's now time to 
uh, read. Melda means read. The Ketuva, the marriage certificate. Uh, so uh, the rabbi came with his Mema, which is that hat. You can see him there with the hat, the white and red hat. And Jube, Jube means that long white jacket. Uh, and all the uh, and all the people, uh, all the people are already there. And Moshon is uh, really, really happy. Uh, Moshon, uh, take her in hand. Let's go to the Seuda. Seuda is a celebratory meal. Uh, Moshon is saying, how am I going to pay? How am I going to pay you? Nobody does this for me. Uh, you are gonna, you are gonna pay me. Walking and talking, the friend said, "Come on, Moshan, let's go to the hotel." So, uh, all all three of them went to the hotel. They came to the hotel. Look, Moshan, in the third room there, down there, below, everything is ready. Go straight. There are two, three doors at the third. You're gonna enter with your bride. Come on, go in, Moshan. And uh, he and Moshan said. Um, oh my gosh, everything is ready, what you did to me uh, until now. Uh, how am I going to pay you? Do you know how? And then the friend said, uh, take, take the bride, take her you. So that's just a kind of normal, that's just a recording of somebody telling a story about what happened. So now we can hear it oh. in the actual recording. So after one date at the theater, they're getting married the following Tuesday? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my my grandmother, uh, her auntie had a lodger uh, who was my grandfather. She took him uh, a meal and he played mandolin to her. And then he went and spoke to her father and said, I like your daughter. I think she she smiled at me. I think she liked me. Can we get married? They got married two weeks later. La boda de Moshon contó Shoshana Levi, página 23. En Estambul había un Moshon. Muchas vecinas le traían novias, ma él no quería. Salió un amigo y le dijo, Moshon, yo te voy a traer una novia, la más lucia de Estambul. Y me meto la trucha, una lucior, una carica hermosa, le dice el amigo, ay de Moshon, na la novia, toma la engagé. Moshon la tomó engagé, Moshon llévala al cinema, Moshon la llevó al cinema con el amigo. Moshon, para martes va a ser el día de la tevila, vamos a esperar en la puerta en juntos, tú y yo, ay de Moshon. Ya es hora que se va a meldar la que tú va. Ya vino el rab con la mema y la jubé. Ya está toda la gente y Moshon está alegría grande. Moshon, toma la engagé, nos iremos a la ciudad. Le está diciendo Moshon, ¿cómo te puedo pagar yo a ti? Esto no me lo hace ninguno. Ya me vas a pagar. Caminando y hablando, le dice el amigo. Ay, de Moshon. Vamos al hotel. Ya vinieron los tres al hotel. Mira Moshon, en la tercera camareta de, de allá abajo, ya está todo pronto. Va a tener derecho. Hay dos, tres puertas. A la tercera te vas a entrar adentro con la novia. Ay, de, entra Moshon. Le dice Moshon, adiós. Esto todo bueno que me hiciste tú a mí fin ahora. ¿Cómo que te lo pague yo? ¿Sabes cuál? Tómala a la novia y llévatela tú. So if you go, um, if you go to Istanbul and if anybody knows Istanbul, there's a Galata Tower at the end of Istiklal Jadesi. Um, in that neighborhood to this day, you still hear older people speaking that language you have So this discussion about the wedding, when was that, what year was that supposed to have happened? 1979. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Hakitia is the other variety of Judeo-Spanish. And this is 
uh, otherwise known by linguists as Western Judeo-Spanish. It's spoken in northern Morocco, Melidia, which is a Spanish enclave in North Africa, and northwest Algeria. 47% of Hakatia is uh, Spanish, 34% is Moroccan Darija, so local Moroccan Arabic, and 18.5% of the words are Hebrew. It's a real mixed language, like, like English. Um, and this is, I think, also from about 19, uh, maybe 1979, maybe early 80s. And this is a video of a song in Hakatia. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't have English subtitles. It has French, some French subtitles, and the quality is not very good. But it's there is a modern version, but I wanted to show it the original, quote unquote, authentic video. And they're singing in Hakatia, and it's a wedding, a wedding song from Fez in Morocco. Now we move on to Arabic, which people normally don't mention when I ask what, what are the Jewish languages. Um, and Arabic has a long history of uh, use in the Jewish community. And on the left here is a Siddur, uh, which was published recently, Siddur Farhi, which is um, in both Arabic and Hebrew and English, actually. So, uh, written Judeo-Arabic emerged in the 9th century CE, so not very long after Islamic Judeo, uh, after Islamic Arabic emerged as a written language. And it was the language of the Rambam. So uh, Maimonides, his, he wrote um, the Mishneh Torah in Judeo-Arabic. Uh, it has regional varieties. So every, every uh, uh, country where uh, Arabic speaking Jews live or, or where they kept, came from, there is a, a Jewish variety of that Arabic. And there are differences between Jewish and non Jewish Arabic. So, uh, one of them, one example is uh, so, that, so first of all, there's too many examples to give. 
Um, so I'm, I just limited it to this. Uh, Moroccan, uh, Moroccan Jews will say a sh sound when Muslims say s. So goodbye in uh, Muslim Moroccan is the slama, the slama. Jews say the slama. Why? Because uh, it's written in the Hebrew alphabet. And in order to write the sh sound, they write shin. So whenever they would, they would write, um, the, they were intending to write the, the slama. What's they, happening? They, they ended up writing. Uh, it's, it's coming to the end of the soccer in the United States and Japan. They ended up writing the slama. Uh, and the same thing happened with the z sound. So people are fam usually familiar with the word tagine, which is a type of Moroccan plate that you cook in. That z sound was ended up being written with a, a zain, a z, which resulted in Jews from Morocco saying tanzia instead of tanzia, which Muslims say. And there's many, many examples. And then this is a song in what I believe is uh, Syrian or Iraqi, I can't remember. Um, and I wonder if anybody can tell what it is. And, and those of you at home would like to sing along, the refrain at the end of every verse is Allahu, Allahu, La illa illahu. I said, I wonder if anyone can guess what this is, but I uh, forgot. Dad, yeah, I dad, yeah. Yeah, had me oh. there. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Exactly. Is there anything? Is there anything that stood out there, like the refrain that they kept repeating? It was more that it kept repeating things. 
You yeah. go after a while, you said, oh, they're saying the same, they're adding on and saying the same thing. And it's like, oh, wait a second. I know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. But what they were repeating was Allahu, Allahu, la ilaha illahu, which is yeah. there is only one God. There is only one God. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is sounds Islamic because they're saying Allahu, Allahu, la ilaha illahu. But um, Allah is what Jews from Jewish, uh, from Muslim countries, not just Arabic speaking countries, but Jews from Muslim countries, is, is how they say God. It's Allah. It's like the same, has the same meaning as the word God. That, that struck me, the, the using the word Allah, because for most of us, we associate it with so, such a, a non Jewish connotation. Yeah, Ashkenazim associates it. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, that's exactly. right. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're, exactly. are we not the center of the earth? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but no, I, I'm glad. I'm glad that you said that because uh, that's true. Um, and uh, when I I grew up in a small in a small city, um, well, actually fifty thousand people, and there were five Jewish families, uh, two of whom were Iraqi, uh, and one was Moroccan. And then mine, which is Italian and Albanian origin. And um, yeah, uh, the Moroccan, the mother of my Moroccan friend uh, would always say, Ya Allah, instead of, oh my God, Ya Allah. And I didn't know that that wasn't a Jewish thing until I was about 11 years old and went to an Ashkenazi liberal synagogue. So, yeah. So the next Jewish language is Yiddish. <clears throat> uh, does anybody know what uh, Kamala is supposedly saying at the top on the top picture? Mamala, 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 mamala. Yeah, what does that mean? Like little mom. Yeah, mummy. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> so uh, Yiddish was once spoken from Alsace to the Urals. So Alsace is now in France, and the Urals is the border of Asia and Europe in uh, in Russia. Uh, it is to this day severely endangered, um, and at the eve of the Shoah, there were thirteen million. There were, I should say, thirteen million speakers. So Yiddish literally means Jewish. I mentioned that before. It's also called Mama Lushen, the, or the mother tongue. And it's the speech of, or, or the heritage language of Central and Eastern European Ashkenazi. And it's a West German variety. It integrates Ashkenazic Hebrew, Aramaic, Slavic, and Romance lexicon. So by Romance, I mean Italian varieties, which is surprising to a lot of people. But is anybody is familiar with the word venture? or benching. Does anybody know what that means, benching? Right. Yeah. Sort of, yeah, like blessing. Like blessing at the end of, uh, of a meal. Uh, and that comes from benediction. Mm. Oh. Bent to, yeah. to, to bench, yeah. Didn't know that. <clears throat> yeah. Vocês duas amin zusammenstoß so ist es so ging ja aber ich mege übertreiben na bissere ähm aber in Toronto Toronto ist nicht New York du darfst es verstehen sie ist guren an der Stadt sie ist sie ist nicht da die jüdische Kehle dort ist ist sehr ein anderer Sort Kehle wie die jüdische Kehle New York sie sind Toronto der Hitten New York zieht sie Menschen von der ganzen Welt und Amerikaner jeden sind anders von Kanada Hitten is Amerikaner für mich jeden, das ist die moderne orthodoxische Jeden, sind das Sach, bedeutet als Sach mehr offen für der Dreißendbekehr Welt, wie Toronto für mich jeden. Amerikaner jeden sind bedeutet als mehr offen für der Dreißendbekehr Welt, wie, wie Toronto jeden bekommen. Es ist so einander, es ist Amerika, es ist sehr schwer zu beschreiben, weil man redet in der Sache, als wenn man eine Verallgemeinung äh, generalisiert. Aber die Identität bei jedem ist, ist ein anderer in Kanada wie in Amerika. Wir können das nicht verstehen in Amerikaner Begriffen.
a little bit of a controversial example, I suppose. Um, Did you pick that one on purpose? <laughs> uh, I, I, I have no comment on uh, the <laughs> community in Toronto, whether what he said is true or not. Uh, but it's a, an example of somebody that's involved in an uh, um, oral, um, oral language project, uh, you know, speaking Yiddish, young people that speak Yiddish. And I know the context of what he was saying. He said that in Toronto, they often meet up and speak Yiddish in the street or in cafes, and nobody bats an eyelid. But in Toronto, people will say, why are you speaking that? What are you speaking that for? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, that was their experience. I don't know why or any more details about it. But it's a good example of what Yiddish sounds like. Can I just make a comment on that? Yep. The original community of religious Jews here came from Western Europe, so Hungary, uh, Poland, Germany. Whereas in New York, there was a much more mixed crowd of Lithuanian Jews, Ukrainian Jews, Russian Jews. So when I hear uh, Jewish people from the United States speaking Yiddish, and they insist that theirs is the only kind of Yiddish, I get really annoyed because I pronounce it the way we pronounce it, ich red Yiddish. You know, so like I pronounce it with my pronunciations and they um, pronounce it completely differently. I still understand what they're saying, but I don't pretend that mine is the only kind of Yiddish. And it annoys right. me when they pretend that there's the right kind of Yiddish and every other kind of Yiddish is just bad pronunciation. So it's a little irritating. Just right, right. <laughs> not, not to get into that, but isn't that Evo um, established to to uh, determine what the proper Yiddish was, whether that's... Evo, well, Evo does not have the right to establish proper Yiddish as if it's the only Yiddish because the people from Yivo were Lithuanians from Kiev, and their pronunciation was different than the Hungarians or the Polish Yiddish speakers. So they should not be imposing their Yiddish as the correct way of speaking Yiddish. That's just my opinion. Yeah, this is a common problem with endangered language and minority languages that there's always one group that wants to standardize it in order to protect it, which is a good intention. But what they end up doing is endangering the other varieties and doing exactly the same as majority languages. Um, yeah, and actually on that note, there is a shop in uh, as it's a baker's in the East End of London, uh, in Brick Lane, that sells the round uh, bread thing that Ashkenazim make, which is called what? Bagel. Little... Bagel. Bagel. Yeah, the one that begins with B. If you go into that shop and ask for it that way, they won't give it to you. Why? Because in England, they're called bagels. Because uh, Yiddish speakers in, in England came from the West. And in the West Yiddish uh, dialects, uh, it's called bagel, not bagel. And, and there's a like uh, long-standing joke that if you go in there and say bagel, they'll give you an extra one. If you say bagel, they'll tell you they've run out. As long as it's not bagel, which yeah. some non-Jewish people have started calling that food. Yeah, exactly. Which might yeah. Just yeah. So I think that in the Americas, uh, it was eaten Yiddish speakers that brought uh, Yiddish over. Um, and that's why it's called bagel in the, in the Americas, that it's bagel in, in the UK. Um, yeah. So another, okay, we've already seen this. This is Judeo Malayalam. So does anyone want to, does anyone know or want to guess where, where this is spoken? Is that India or Bangladesh? India, so southern India, yeah, exactly. Yeah. In Kerala, there's specifically in a town called Cochin. 
Uh, it's the world's only Dravidian Jewish language. So Dravidian is the South Indian languages, which um, some leaders consider to be much older than the Indo-European languages, which are spoken in the north of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, etc. Uh, yeah, I mentioned that. Um, it shares features typical of all Jewish languages, which are verbatim translations from Hebrew and Aramaic. Uh, so, for example, in Ladino, um, in the Passover Seder, uh, you say la noche la esta, on uh, this night, which is a direct translation from Hebrew, um, halayla haze, um, and it has all of the other features that all Jewish languages have. Uh, it has archaic features of Malayalam, uh, so that means that it's like, uh, like Judeo-Arabic, in fact, and Yiddish and Ladino it retains older features of the non-Jewish language that it's surrounded by. And actually, uh, Cochin, in Cochin, there are two Jewish communities. One is called the Pardesi community, which means originally foreign community. That was Iraqi Baghdadi Jews that came in the 15th century, and they established themselves there. And then there was the other uh, Jewish community before, which they called the Black Jews, who are local Malayalam speaking Jews. And nobody really knows. There are some speculations or some good theories about where they might have come from originally. And the, the most commonly accepted theory is that they came from Yemen. And because Kerala is on the is a major port, trading port, the Arabian Sea, the Yemeni Jews came over and probably 2000 years ago. So the Christian community spoken in the same area also uses Aramaic as a liturgical language and is probably one of the oldest Christian communities in the world as well, dating from that time. And this is an example of Pardesi uh, Jews speaking to quote unquote black Jews from Kochi. yeah so i don't know if you noticed but there was the typical overlapping cooperative overlapping yeah <laughs> and do you, does anyone notice anything else typical it's not exactly a linguistic thing there's something typical of first time Jewish conversations. Do you know such and such? Do you know such and such? Yeah, do you know Alison? No, I'm not sure. Da, 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 da. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Oh, oh, the Mookins. Oh, yeah, of course. Josie Mookins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and so those those three women on the left had emigrated to Israel and were visiting Cochin and speaking to local Jews. And they did that thing. And they're, oh, do you know this person? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everything was still. Jewish language, typical features there. Also, the voice of the men was much louder than that yeah. of the women. Yeah, I did. I did notice that too. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's a whistle stop tour of some of the Jewish languages. Could do an hour or more on each one of them, um, and it's quite difficult to choose which some which examples to give and which videos to show and there are other 
maybe more linguistic videos about Malayalam and all of the other ones. And I didn't speak about Neo-Aramaic or Aramaic, uh, which of course are major Jewish languages too. I mean, Neo-Aramaic Neo is one Jewish language spoken by Kurdish Jews, but Aramaic is a Jewish liturgical language, which a lot of people don't, men don't sort of mention or don't realize that they know things like the Kaddish. The Kaddish is in Aramaic, not in Hebrew. Um, yeah, uh, so that's uh, at the Whistle Stop Tour. Yeah.